रुक जा रे बंदया ये रात जरा सी है बात समझ बंदया कुछ देर ही बाकी है रख यकीया खों से बादल आज हट जाएगा चाद तेरी आंखों में बंदया चल के Shalini Saraswati and uh, I'll, I'll go through it a little bit more of detail in terms of the video, it's an abridged version. So exactly 10 years ago, my life changed. Um, that's kind of an understatement, but we'll go with that. Um, I came down with a very rare infection, it's called rickettsia with moths. I went on a holiday to Cambodia and I somehow feel I'm single-handedly responsible for destroying their tourism, but a disclaimer out there, Cambodia is a beautiful place, please go there. Um, and I came back to India, but I was, I was all right for almost a month. Um, I think uh, the bacteria and me had a great relationship for a year. And then like a lot of relationships these days, we decided to break up. And uh, I went to the hospital with uh, initial inst um, symptoms of just fever, a very high white platelet count, all symptoms of dengue and malaria. And uh, when I went to the hospital, we thought that was what it was going to be. I was also pregnant at that point in time. So we were really focused about saving the baby at that point in time. And uh, that is my last memory of getting into the hospital. And uh, things went down south from there. I was in, on a life support system for seven days. I was given a 3% chance of survival. And uh, my heart stopped beating twice. My lungs um, did not function. I think none of my organs functioned at all. And I don't think I was meant to ever survive it. Um, but for whatever reasons, I did. And uh, when I did wake up in the hospital, I noticed that all my limb extremities had turned a dark blue-black. Was, it was absolute thrombosis of all my capillaries. But like, I kept thinking that, you know, it's going to be fine. It's not going to be the end of the world. And, you know, we live in a time where medicine's really made a lot of progress. You know, they're going to give me some medication. We're going to get on and move on with life. Um, I had a doctor that told me that there was a very likely chance that I might lose all my limbs. Um, but I really thought that there was going to be a miracle. It's like, I think, watching a lot of Bollywood movies, right? There's that miraculous moment where someone's banging the temple and then somebody like miraculously wakes up. So that was the moment I was waiting for. Um, about, I came back home and uh, then I had gangrene set in in both my legs. That was a difficult moment because nothing in your life prepares you um, to smell the flesh, smell your own flesh rotting. Um, there are no reference points. You really don't know how to deal with it. Um, and I dealt with it like how all of us would. I was angry, I shut myself down. Um, Ayurveda came in, uh, things began to get better, um, the things began to heal. Uh, simultaneously, I went back to work. And the best way to describe my limbs at this point in time is dried wood, because it's dry gangrene. And uh, the constant tapping on the laptop, I managed to fracture my first hand, and that was how I lost my first amputation. Happened in March of 2013, and this one went away. Uh, six months later, the rest of this hand fell off. It's called auto-amputation. Um, the body decides to let go when it doesn't need a body part anymore. With that said, I think we decided that <clears throat> there was no point in really waiting anymore, and we had to really let go of both the legs. In some ways, I was kind of relieved because I was for about close to two years in bed by this point in time with no idea whether if I was ever going to be better, uh, with no idea of how my life was going to turn out at all. <clears throat> So with that done in September 2013, I went ahead and amputated both my legs. And then my journey with prosthetics started. And like the video that you saw, I have a lot of legs. 
Um, and uh, when I did wear them on for the first time, you know, you tend to walk like this um, because you, you forget what it's like to walk. I've been bedridden for two years and these babies are about two and a half kilos each. Fun fact, your legs actually even weigh that much, but you don't really realize it because it's part of your body, right? Um, and then, you know, I realized I had put on weight, um, all of those things, and I really just wanted to feel better about myself. And um, that was how I met my coach, and we decided to, we didn't at that point in time decide to run, because at that point, all I wanted to was to be able to walk like this, so that nobody knew that I was wearing prosthetic legs. And that's about it. I wanted to climb off stairs, get off stairs, sit in a chair and get off chairs. Just very basic things in life. And uh, we started to walk a lot. And uh, along the line, we figured we could run. We were very excited about it because we were like, woohoo, something different. And uh, Coach came up with the idea that, you know, let's run 10, 10 kilometers. I honestly thought he had lost his marbles. Why? Like, why would you expect me to run 10 kilometers, right? Able-bodied people are not doing it. When I was able-bodied, I never ran 10 kilometers. This did not make sense in any sense of the world. And, um, and then I, I think I said yes to kind of a play along because I thought this was never going to work because somewhere he's going to realize that I cannot do it. And I knew that I wouldn't do it either. Um, but he's a very determined man. Uh, and I remember like on one Saturday, he called me and he said that, listen, you know what? Uh, let's, uh, let's try this today at the stadium. And I remember gasping. I wanted to give up. Uh, that's about 20 rounds at the Kantirwa Stadium. And I said, listen, I don't think I can do this, but he wouldn't let go. And he pushed. And I remember how I felt that day. I felt like I had climbed up the Himalayas. And that was what I felt. And I realized that this was for me. And that's how I ended up in running my first TCS in 2016. I did an abysmal job of two hours. And uh, I ran again the next year because I wanted to redeem myself and do better, and I did it in an hour and 35. Um, today, I, and then after that, um, you know, bhagne ka bhoot chadaya, if that's how you want to say it. But uh, then we decided that we were going to go into professional athleticism, which, again, uh, to decide to do that once you're 30, not really the smartest decision in the room, but that's what we went with. And uh, today, I am a 100-meter sprinter. I got my first national medal last year, and I followed it up with another medal this year. And uh, the, the, the dream is to try and make it to the Asian Games was this year. But thank you, COVID, again. It's got moved to the next year. So somehow, I always think that, you know, this is the last year I'm going to run, and then I'm going to eat. Right? Uh, but somehow the universe has other plans for me and I have to wait for another year and not eat and hopefully then do the Asian Games next year. Um, of course, I think running's what's helped me heal. It's, um, it's been the magic portion that has absolutely healed me. It's given me the wings that I thought I had lost. Um, it's healed me in so many ways. It's given me my, back my confidence. It's made me feel okay with my body. Because, you know, you don't, it takes you a really long while to become okay with looking at this in the mirror. Um, and I think more than anything else, I think running has given me so many moments to point my non-existent finger into the sky and tell the person up there that they chose to mess with the wrong person. You know, I was larger than that and there was no getting back to me. Now with that, <coughs> I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'll have to do this with a little bit of notes. Um, I'm just going to learn point out some of the key lessons that I've had that's really helped me get through with my life. I think the first thing is acceptance is the key to moving forward. Now, um, for very long, I think um, I couldn't accept what has happened. Um, it's not an easy thing to accept as well. You know, for 32 years, I was able-bodied. And uh, then to wake up with all your limbs missing, and then to also accept the fact that you are dependent on another human for the rest of your life, even to get a glass of water, it's not the easiest thing to do. And, you know, I was angry for very long. I was angry with the world. I was angry with God, the universe. I was angry with anybody who had limbs for very long because I couldn't understand why I deserved it. Um, because, you know, we're, you know, as you sow, so shall you reap. And in my head, I didn't sow anything so bad to be able to get this in life, right? Um, 
And like we're always told as we were growing up, if you do good things, good things happen to you. If you do bad things, bad things happen to you. And I couldn't for the life of me figure out like, what did I do so bad that I had deserved something like this? And there are just so many tears from the physical pain as well. And the key fundamental truth is that no matter how I felt about my situation, um, my situation does not change. I could be angry, I could be upset, I could be depressed, I could have anxiety about it. But what just stays with me is those emotions. But my situation does not change unless I decide to embrace it and accept it and say, hey, it's a part of me. What I learned is what I can't change, you endure. And you know, I think um, uh, I didn't really realize that was what I was doing unless I read the book called Forest of Enchantment. If you've read it, it's by Chitra Banerjee. It's, uh, it's the Sita, and it's Sita's version of the Ramayana. So it's the perspective of Ramayana from Sita, right? So there's a the last part in the book where <clears throat> Sita is, um, you know, has been banished by Ram from the kingdom. She's, she realizes that she's pregnant with her children. She's very angry about it. She's very upset about it. And she sits in a little forest and she's having this conversation. I'm going to read out this part for you. It says, all the way back, I pondered the word endure, what it meant. It didn't mean giving in. It didn't mean being weak or accepting injustice. It meant taking the challenges thrown at us and dealing with them intelligently as, as intelligently as we can until we grew stronger than them. That is what I'm going to work on. And I felt like that so much resonated with me because that was the only way that I could deal with it, that I'm going to work uh, with it as intelligently as I can until my disability becomes my strength. And that's where we are right now. The second is about running and how it's helped me. Um, so I was telling you about, um, you know, I, I, I was in a very similar forum like this, somebody asked me, why didn't I choose something that was easier? Why do you choose running? I was a very interesting question, I thought, because I didn't look, up, look at it that way at all. Like, running happened to me, and, and I don't really like running. It's tough. It's, like, I don't even know why I do it, but, yeah, but it's crazy, right? And, um, and, but I think, like, I really like the person that I am after I finish my run. And that's what works for me, right? Um, during my first race, um, it was a really hot summer in May 2016. Like, it was so hot that the Kenyans were fainting, right? So that's something to talk about. Um, at the six kilometer mark, I, I was exhausted. I didn't know that my blood pressure had really fallen. And I remember talking to coach and telling him that, listen, I wanted to quit. I don't think I can do this. And coach said that, listen, you know, drink some water. We're going to deal with this, you know, one step at a time. Just continue this. And along the way, I had to really ask the question that, who was I running for? And the answer really was for me that, Charles, if you could run, thi run this race, you can deal with the rest of your life. And that's what running became for me, right? It became the way that this is going to get me through the rest part of my life. And, uh, and, and that's why I continue to do it. Um, and if you had asked a doctor that day, like, was I physically fit to do that race that day? They would have told you no, because my blood pressure was really low. I was severely dehydrated. But what really got me through was that mind through that entire part, telling me, Charles, you have to do this. Of course, at the end of the race, I fainted, threw up at the doctor. That's a different story. But the point was that I actually did get through the race. And it teaches you about the power of your own mind, right? About how sometimes something that we think is impossible happens only because we believe it's possible. And some of the key things that I've learned with running as well is one, is that you can be as super talented as you want, but if you cannot back that up with turning up every single day, putting in your hard work and sweat, you are never going to be successful. Yeah, and it's something that I've learned the hard way. Um, the other thing that you learned is a very management leadership lesson that you need to have a coach or a leader that believes in you. Like for me, having a coach that saw the impossible within me and to be able to inspire me to be able to do that, it takes a certain amount of leadership for you to be able to do that. And I think that if we could be half a leader as that, we'll have a great um, organization running because you'll absolutely be able to find the tick that makes people work. Um, it's taught me to be okay with losing, and I'm not saying that, you know, when you run a race and if you didn't win, you're not going to be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed. But what most athletes and all of us do is we always go back and look at the race and figure out what went wrong. 
Where did I lose that 0.5 second? Where did I lose that 0.1 second? And that makes a difference. Was your start slow? Did you get off the block slowly? Uh, did you, could you have finished stronger? So it teaches you really to go back, work on what really went wrong, and work on it every single day. It teaches you patience. Rome wasn't built in a day. It took me, um, I've been running since 2014, is when I started, but in 2022. And it's taken me every day to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, six days a week um, of practice to get to a point where I am a professional athlete today. It didn't come overnight at all. So you can't expect that if you want to, um, to do that at all, you'll have to do it. You'll have to work it out differently. And I think the last lesson from running is having a goal gives you purpose. And I think human beings also derive self-value from having a goal. For me, I think specifically my self-value was zero with having lost all my limbs. And I think running just put that back for me. Um, running also gave me a lot of confidence, healing, um, but more than anything else, I think it taught me to own my disability, to be okay about my blades. Um, it made me totally feel badass when I walk out in my blades, and I think that is something I don't think anything could have given to me. Um, today I'm recognized as a, bla uh, as a blade runner, and it opens up conversation. You know, I'm at the stadium, and I have kids who would come up to me and ask me, you know, why do my hands look like the way they do? They want to know all of the gory details. They think that I have extremely nice legs, and they want one of them. I hope they don't, but you know, that is. And what it does basically is anchors disability exactly where it belongs, out in the open. Um, my next learning is about how disability is just an adjective. It's meant to describe you, it doesn't become you. Now, um, it's not easy, like I said, you know, to be able to accept what has happened. Um, and especially, I think, as a woman as well, <clears throat> um, you know, we grow up with a lot of social media expectations, magazines, models. We're very hard on ourselves, we're very hard on our bodies. And there is an image which we know is never achievable, but we aspire to want to have it. There's never a time if you ask any woman in this room who's happy with her body. And, and that is whether you are a model or you're not. We're all the same. We're always thinking about how our bodies could have been different. And it's a really tough one for me to be and to look in the mirror and to be able to accept it, right? So there's a lot of physical changes. And then there's also the way you perceive yourself and the world perceives yourself. Now, one of the things that India gives as a constitutional right is staring, right? Now, one is, as a person with a disability, whether you believe in any other constitutional right or not, we Indians believe that staring is definitely there. So one of the things that you have to deal with the disability is to be able to accept the staring, right? Today I tell myself I'm a movie star, and that's probably the reason they're staring. And today what I also do is I give you five minutes. I'm in a room, you can stare at me for five minutes, because that's your time to kind of cope with it and then I stare back at you. Because, you know, we can both, it takes two of us can play this game. Um, but it also opens your world up to sympathy, uh, a lot of sympathy, right? Now, sympathy is easy. It comes from a position of power, right? Empathy is going down on your knees, looking me in the eye, and thinking that the only difference between you and me is a matter of luck, nothing else. And the minute you're able to realize that, you become a kinder person, and it's a game changer. And I think, um, for me then, uh, you know, disability, I have learned that it's only an adjective. It describes me, but it doesn't have to become me. It's not me, right? Today I'm someone who's extremely proud of my disability because there's a lot of advantages. You know, you don't have to wait in the queue at the airport. Um, you, you know, you can get away flashing. All of it, bars never say no to you. They never say no to giving you a table. They always give you an additional drink. There's a lot of perks of being disabled. Um, the last learning that I'm going to talk about is some journeys are extremely uncomfortable, but they're absolutely required for your own personal growth. Now, deciding to run, and this was a crazy dream to want to run, it took me completely out of my comfort zone. Um, because, you know, it's physically and mentally both very asking of me. But what's helped me is that it's taken small, consistent steps to get to the point where I am. Um, and like I said, you know, it's taken me from 2015 to 2021, um, to be, to turn up every single day at practice to get my first medal. Um, so, you know, you have to be able to, willing to put that kind of hard work if you want that crazy dream. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. And um, 
you know, a lot of times I think, you know, I've also been afraid of, oh my God, I don't want to fail. Um, what if I'm a huge disappointment? And I don't want to feel this way, but I've realized that those are dead people goals. Only dead people are never inconvenienced by their thoughts, are, are going to feel frustrated about it. And, um, you know, you can never get, and you know, you can never um, uh, get to live a meaningful life if you're not willing to go through the stress and have your heart broken and feel all of the things that you feel. I think tough emotions are part of our contract with life and you don't get to have a meaningful career or raise a family or leave the world a better place without stress or discomfort. And I also think that uncomfortable journeys also teach you to question your path, um, your purpose, your reason to live or die. And those, I think, are very deep questions that we need to ask. The last one, um, and my last learning, is about the impermanence of life. We all in this room, and I myself, believe that there's going to be, when I turn 50, I'm going to retire. At 60, I'm going to be living uh, in Goa by the beach and living the life that I want to. Trust me, um, none of that is ever going to happen if you don't decide to live today, right? Um, you don't know what's going to happen with your life. It takes a switch of a button for life to absolutely change. And the only thing that you control is what you can do today in this moment. So live in this today's moment. Walk on grass, hold hands, because you're going to miss it when you can't do it. Um, you know, uh, sit on the beach, um, call up and tell people that you love them, give lots of hugs. Uh, you never know uh, when life's going to change. So all you can do is do that. Maya Angelou says that, uh, um, you know, every, it's, it's never the buildings or uh, your legacy is not the buildings that you build. It's every life that you've been able to touch. So I hope for everybody in the audience today that you can look back at your life and think that you've at least been able to touch one life. Um, I'm going to give live you, I know my time's up, but I'm going to leave you with one, one last um, poetry. It's not mine, but it's somebody who is obviously very sensible who's written it. Someone once told me to always live for the little things in life. Live for 5 a.m. sunrises and 5 p.m. sunsets. Well, you've seen the colors in the sky that don't usually belong. Live for road trips and bike rides with music in your ears and wind in your hair. Live for the days when you're surrounded by your favorite people who make you believe that the world is not a cold, harsh place. Live for the little things because they will make you realize that that is what life is about. That is what it means to be alive. So have a beautiful day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.